Give folks just a couple of minutes to trickle in and then we'll get started. Can we move Leandra over? <laughs> Thanks, Amanda. Uh, so good afternoon, committee members and members of the public. Uh, thank you for joining us for the June meeting of the Equity and Aging Advisory Committee. We're excited to bring everyone together today for a discussion around affordability of long-term care, especially home and community care, um, and vaccine equity. Before we get started, I would be remiss not to go over a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first off, closed captioning and ASL are available. To enable captions, please select the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. Our ASL interpreters, you should be seeing Alonzo right now, uh, are visible just to the side of the presentation. The recording, presentation, and resources from today's meeting will be posted to the California Department of Aging's Equity and Aging Resource Center. Past meeting materials are archived on this page as well. Uh, participants will be muted during the presentation and committee discussion. However, we're saving time at the end for public comment. Um, please note that we will be in listening mode today. If you would like to make a comment, please use the raise hand icon feature at the bottom of your screen. For those joining by phone, you can join the queue by pressing star nine. Uh, if we're not able to get to your comment or you would like to submit a public comment after the meeting, please email at us at, at, at uh, engage at aging.ca.gov. And I will turn it over to Amanda. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, very happy to be joined by everyone here today. Uh, unfortunately, Director McCoy Wade um, is feeling a little under the weather, so she is unable to join us today. Um, if she calls in later on, that's fantastic. But of course, we wish her well and hope that she gets enough rest to come back to work uh, soon. Um, in addition to myself, we're joined by our um, community, our sorry, our aging and equity um, co-leads of this committee. We have um, Denny Chan. He'll actually be joining us this uh, the second half of this meeting. Michael Murray is here, who is the Strategic Business Operations Director from AARP California. And then we have Rigo Saborio, President and CEO of St. Barnabas Senior Services. I'm also joined by um, some CDA staff today. Connie Nakano, who is our Communications Director, will be joining us. And Carmen Gibbs will be here later for the second half of the meeting. And then I've asked Terry Shaw and Carrie Graham, who were consultants to the Master Plan for Aging, to join us for some of our discussions later today. For the agenda, so we have several items to discuss. Um, you know, very excited. California is reopening and summer is upon us, but there is still so, so much work to do um, in ensuring equity in the COVID-19 response and also ensuring that all of our master plan for aging initiatives have that equity lens applied to it. So the purpose of this committee is to provide advice and counsel and accountability to the MPA's implementation and that we achieve our equity goals through our implementation. Each meeting that we have will focus on different initiatives or elements of the master plan for aging implementation. And today on this agenda, you can see that we're focusing on two priority items, making long-term care affordable to all, especially home and community care that prevents institutionalization, as well as vaccine equity as part of our COVID response rooted in equity. Um, First, we're going to go ahead and do a, a good welcome, go through our roster. We can all say hello to each other. And then we will move into um, Rigo's piece of the agenda, just talk a bit about the equity committee meetings and structure and our recruitment efforts. Then Marty and Donna will lead us in a discussion related to the long-term care insurance task force. We'll have a little break, as I know uh, these meetings can go a little long. We all have a lot of screen time lately. And then um, Denny Chan and Connie Nakano will join us for that um, COVID-19 response and vaccine equity discussion. Then Michael Murray will allow, um, we'll open up the floor to everyone for um, anyone who has member updates or suggestions for future agenda priority items. Then we'll take public comments and then we'll move on to next steps. 
So we're gonna go ahead and do our roll call and Maria will uh, lead that. Thank you, Amanda. Um, isn't it funny? I can't spotlight my video, so I hope folks don't mind. <laughs> uh, so we'll go through roll call. If you could just say here or uh, uh, present, if your name is called, that would be really great. Uh, Bernice Nunez Constant. She's unable to make it, but sends her regards and regrets to everybody. Betsy Butler. Here. Hello, everyone. Hi, Betsy. Catherine Blakemore. Also has a conflict, but sends her greetings. <laughs> Cheryl Brown, I know you're here. Yes, how are you? I'm here. <laughs> Thanks, Cheryl. Derek Lamb. Hello, everyone. I'm here. Uh, Denny Chan. He'll be here at two, three o'clock. Donna Benton. Hi, everyone. Hi, Donna. Edie Yao. Hi, I'm here. Fantastic. Kiara Harris. Yara is actually in Ghana right now. Ooh, so she's all right. Ghana. <laughs> Jeffrey Reynoso. Good afternoon here. I will be in and out though. Got it. Kevin Prindeville. Marcy Edelman. Hi there. Hi. Hi, Marcy. Uh, Marielle Creasel. Marty Lynch. I think I saw Marty earlier. Yeah, I am. I'm here, Maria. Uh, can I, I have to take a quick second to say that a reminder to everybody, because I'm one of the people working on climate change in the master plan that we're in. We're coming up on an extreme heat event in the next couple of days for much of the state. And just a reminder to help our constituents and patients and clients stay hydrated in cool places. We know it's an equity issue because who doesn't afford air conditioning and that sort of thing. So, you know, big issue, big health issue with climate change and an equity issue. That reminder, Marty, that's very helpful. Uh, Michael Murray. Here, good afternoon. Hi, Michael. Uh, Rigo. Here, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks, Marty, for that note. Absolutely, I certainly seen firsthand folks that are, you know, not able to afford uh, EAC. And so uh, that's an important point to highlight. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Valentin Villa. She is out of town. And Leandra Clark Harvey. I'm here. Hey, Leandra, I'm glad you were able to get on. Um, and with that, I think I pass it back to you, Amanda. Great, thank you, Maria. Let me make sure my Zoom is working. Okay, well, what I'd like to do right now is provide um, a few updates on Master Plan for Aging implementation. Um, these are just some highlights from goal area three. I mean, there's work going on that spans the entire master plan for aging that would advance equity in aging, but I'm really gonna focus on those goal three updates. So here we have um, strategy A, which is inclusion and equity in aging. And for initiative 75, I do have a budget update that, and this is a proposal in the budget would be 20 million one-time general fund to improve and deliver language access services across the spectrum of health and human services programs. Um, so everything on these slides related to the budget either comes from the January proposal or the May revision. It's not updated to reflect the legislature's um, Monday budget. Um, Initiative 77. So those are our ensuring equity and aging webinars. We're hosting our ninth and final webinar on July 7th. So that's the first Wednesday of next month. And it's culturally responsive programs and services in rural communities. And we have four fantastic speakers from across California who are going to share with us ways that they've incorporated the cultural values um, into their services and programming for older adults from different um, backgrounds. And then we have for Initiative 78, um, that is um, our CCOR, or it's, it's CDA, it's called Courage. So, um, and we have um, attended 12 racial equity trainings um, since May last year. This is the team um, at CDA who's really working to improve um, our hiring and, and cultural competency practices at the Department of Aging. And they plan to uh, inform CDA's racial equity action plan later on this year. 
Um, of course, Initiative 80, you are here. It was launched the Equity and Aging Advisory Committee. So here we are in our second meeting and we are in the midst of recruiting a handful of new members to really um, expand the perspectives represented on this committee. Next slide. So the next slide here is digital divide and there is a ton of work going on in this realm, of course, um, and also there are some hefty um, budget proposals that address closing that digital divide. Um, so for initiative 81 of the master plan, you know, there is a $7 billion proposed investment to expand broadband infrastructure across California. And then the federal uh, administration has also launched their emergency broadband benefit to help low income households afford internet service during the pandemic. Um, our comms team has been assisting in some outreach related to this benefit, hoping to get enough many older adults signed up for that benefit. Um, for Initiative 82, um, we shared a bit about this last time, but CDA continues to work on closing the dig digital divide. Um, we have distributed 8,500 smart speakers to older low-income adults who are at risk of isolation, and we've also distributed 4,000 iPads, and those come with two-year plans and dedicated training and technical assistance to lower-income adults who live alone. And then um, we are providing guidance soon to our long-term care ombudsman facilities for robotic pet distribution. Um, initiative 83. So the May revise proposed 17 million in the Older Americans Recovery and Resiliency proposal to distribute even more devices and to really focus on that uh, digital literacy training and partnership for older adults. Next slide. So for strategy C within goal three, that's opportunities to work. And there is a $17 million one-time proposal um, for employment opportunities um, that would add job slots to senior employment program at the Department of Aging. Strategy D is opportunities to volunteer and engage across generations. And so I'm actually very excited that um, CDA in partnership with California State Library and UC Berkeley launched Cal Chronicles um, last month. So Cal Chronicles collects and shares stories from older adults that really shine a light on the invaluable experiences and contributions of older Californians. You can uh, find this on our webpage. The link is right here in this PowerPoint. Um, we've already received some stories. That's very exciting. And we'll, we'll actually, we're working with um, the Village Movement on a couple of webinars that would be related to their diversity and equity uh, activities. So more to come on that. And then really exciting for um, Strategy E, which is building California leadership, would be um, California becoming the eighth age-friendly AARP state. So we joined on June 3rd, um, the AARP Age-Friendly States and Communities Network. Um, we are really excited about this. We'll receive lots of um, technical assistance and really be a part of this broad network that really is focused on um, identifying policies and programmatic solutions to improve the quality of life for older adults um, in collaboration with residents and communities and partners across California. There is a video on our website and if you click the link on this uh, slide later when we distribute those, it'll take you over to that announcement page with the video that features Secretary Galley as well as CDA Director Kim McCoy-Wade and AARP Director for California, Nancy McPherson. And then strategy E, protection from abuse, neglect and exploitation. Um, quick update here, we have convened our interagency elder justice work group. So we pulled together representatives from um, across CHHS, as well as the DOJ and the Department of Insurance um, Administration for Community Living to help us identify um, the priority areas and who the members would be of the forthcoming Elder Justice Coordinating Council. Um, and then um, we also had Justice in Aging and California Welfare Directors Agency present their priority areas and suggestions for action across um, California to address elder justice. This group together, the larger um, Elder Justice Coordinating Council will develop recommendations to prevent and address elder abuse, neglect, exploitation, and fraud. And then Initiative 97, there is just a budget proposal of $20 million um, 
to aid with development of legal assistance developer, which is federally required. And our staff at CDA is working on that. We have our new um, senior counsel, Jeremy Avila, and then assisting him is Carmen Gibbs, who will be here later today. Um, real quick update, next slide on partnership development. You know, local partners are really important for the implementation of the master plan for aging. We know that so much of the work being done is being done on the ground. And so it's invaluable, which is why we created the local playbook to offer a resource to local communities in the implementation of their own age-friendly planning and projects. So um, we have recently um, uh, presented to the California State Association of Counties. Those are the Board of Supervisors. And um, we actually followed that, that one meeting up where Shireen McSpadden and Kevin Prindeville joined us um, with two more presentations. So they're very excited about the Master Plan for Aging work. And then we have also been heavily involved in um, a lot of the convenings going on around California with local communities. I've presented at Santa Cruz and San Benito. Um, there's Kern County. I'm presenting at the Inland Empire coalition meeting soon. So all of these are, most of these are organized through the SCAN Foundation's um, long-term services and supports uh, collaborative. And also public health has been a strong partner in this. So we've been working on presentations and webinars with the Department of Public Health that they're hosting with their local health departments. And then for moving on to the next slide, just want to touch sort of on what next steps are and how we're, uh, you know, maintaining accountability to the master plan for aging and we continue to meet with the cabinet work group. We are meeting this Friday to um, go over implementation plans, activities. Um, this group continues to be very excited and engaged about the master plan for aging and how aging threads through all aspects of government program and planning. Um, our first progress report, much awaited. We'd love to release this soon, but we're waiting for the final budget to come out. So once that budget lands, we will be able to um, release our progress report. We didn't want to release it without identifying the investments that the um, administration has made in aging. Um, and then the impact stakeholder committee, we will announce that pretty much in tandem with the release of that budget. And this impact uh, stakeholder committee will really be that um, sort of oversight body um, to provide advice on um, implementation of the master plan for aging. Then we have the data dashboard for aging. Um, we have some recent updates. Those include internet access, California Lifeline program participation, and uh, APS caseloads. Actually, I'm gonna ask Terry Shaw if she wants to jump in and give us an update on the research work group because there's been a lot of um, discussion on how we can actually ensure, identify our outcomes, our measurable outcomes for the master plan for aging. And I think I heard her click on. There she is. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, thanks, Amanda. Yes, I'm happy to give a very brief update on some continued development of this um, implementation of MPA Initiative 102, uh, which calls for the California Health and Human Services Agency to facilitate a nation leading research partnership on aging with California's universities. And of course, this initiative. Uh, is consistent with the MPA Stakeholder Advisory Committee and Research Subcommittee's research agenda recommendations. Um, and in fact, members of that research subcommittee led by Zia Aga and David Lindemann convened a workshop on May 7th uh, to further explore this concept. And I'm pleased to note that um, I know at least one person here today, Donna Benton was part of that workshop. Um, and in fact, that workshop included more than 25 researchers from California's leading academic institutions, and they expressed support for moving forward and, and continued engagement on this effort. And so CDA is working with the agency partners on next steps, and that will likely start with establishment of a partnership for aging research advisory council. Um, that council would be focused on one of the primary um, focus areas for this initiative generally, which is using data for action and equity. Um, and we're, we would expect that this advisory council would um, serve as a model that could be replicated across other agency, person-centered, data-driven priorities as well. Uh, the initial focus of this advisory council would be to um, help with production of the first MPA outcomes 
report, which is due January 2023. And um, of course, the advisory council would also be established in order to help with the planning of additional um, MPA research partnership opportunities that came out of the um, research subcommittee, such as a research collaborative and um, a data action center. So this advisory council, um, as I said, the CDA is working with agency partners on this concept, but it would likely be staffed by a combination of CDA personnel and consultants supported through um, a combination of MPA implementation funding, as well as philanthropic funding. So um, lots in the works there, and we will certainly keep you posted as we move forward. Thank you so much, Terry. <laughs> um, okay, so our next agenda item um, is, is equity related proposals in the budget. And I actually don't wanna to spend too much time on this. I mean, we, we've seen that this budget, the several proposals that have come out so far include just phenomenal investments in aging. And a lot of the uh, proposals specifically address equity in aging and, and some just in general would advance equity and aging. So I just pulled out on these slides a few highlights that actually track with the master plan for aging. Um, and again, these are proposed investments from the January and May revise and not from Monday's budget. Um, for initiative four, we have um, advancing fair housing and equity, and there is a $2 million investment proposed um, for the Department of Fair Employment and Housing to conduct outreach education campaigns housing surveys and prosecute violations of anti-discrimination or anti-housing discrimination laws. Um, and then for within, I think our role area two, um, prioritization of the inclusion in the budget of the expansion of Medi-Cal to older adults who are undocumented. There are significant um, proposed investments into um, expanding Medi-Cal health to undocumented older adults age 60 and up, but the legislature did propose um, that we actually lower that age for undocumented to 250 and older. Um, next slide. So we have for um, initiative 54, we have for diversifying and aligning those aging demographics in the pipeline of residents in geriatric care and, and primary care, um, a one-time $8 million investment that goes to the Office of Statewide Health Planning and Development to grow and diversify that pipeline for the geriatric medicine workforce, um, which is very exciting. Um, another proposal related to Initiative 62 would be to um, continue California's leadership and commitment to target clinical research into Alzheimer's on gender and racial disparities. And there is a proposed $4 million one-time general fund investment for research to strengthen California's leadership on disparities and equity in Alzheimer's disease. And then for initiative 68, um, we did call a couple times in the master plan for COVID-19 after action reports, one general and one related to skilled nursing facilities. Um, the budget proposal does include a one time $1.7 million investment and then some additional money going forward um, to really identify um, the intersection of COVID-19 health disparities and health equity. And that will include nursing homes in the assessment. Um, and then for Initiative 75, expanding culturally and linguistically competent communications, I mentioned earlier, the $20 million um, proposal to improve language access um, and services across CHHS programs. And then Initiative 81, Broadband Council, um, closing the digital divide in general in the Master Plan for Aging, we saw several hefty budget proposals in the budgets. And then we also um, saw money in that um, general topical area of launching digital literacy support for older adults. So 17 million proposed, um, which is part of that older Americans recovery and resiliency proposal to distribute more um, devices and enhance literacy, digital literacy training. Um, also wanna note that the Broadband for All Act that'll uh, go out to the voters in November, 2022. Uh, for a $10 million general obligation bond to fund internet access um, in those hard to reach areas across the state. Um, that is it for some highlights, very high level highlights of equity master plan and the budget and where they align. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next agenda item, which is um, 
equity committee meetings and structure will update on our recruitment efforts and leading that discussion will be Rigo. All right, thanks, Amanda. Wow, that's uh, there's so much going on. And I think uh, just a good reminder of uh, how important our role is. And as you're looking at all these efforts and the work that's going on in a, in a very positive way. Um, but that said, obviously, uh, in our thinking about our composition, we want to truly be inclusive and in making sure that we're well rounded and have, uh, you know, a, a very comprehensive um, uh, perspective among our membership. And so that said, uh, you know, we really have taken you know, steps forward to uh, achieve that end. And so uh, recruitment materials uh, went out and I hope uh, many of you have uh, seen it, had a chance to view it and also forward to others. Uh, as uh, you may have seen, we're seeking to add five additional members uh, focused particularly on applications from individuals representing tribal and Native Americans, LGBTQ, uh, and immigrant and refugee communities. Uh, we're also looking to uh, ensure that we have representation from the rural perspective within these communities as well. So, uh, uh, so the efforts thus far um, have resulted in about 25 applicants uh, representing the three communities that I mentioned with a third representing rural um, you know, region perspective. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're reaching uh, our objectives and, you know, to have a good pool of candidates, but certainly I think, um, you know, we, we'd like to, uh, if possible, see more. So uh, keep up the good work and, uh, and, uh, and sharing that information with your networks and uh, recruiting additional folks for that uh, process. Um, and, um, and also, you know, there are uh, two members of this committee that have also uh, been added to help with, um, with reviewing the applications and providing recommendations. Uh, and that's Cheryl Brown and uh, Donna Benton. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we certainly welcome uh, others that um, would like to also participate in that uh, review of the applications. Um, so uh, I'm gonna stop there and I think what I'd like is, um, Amanda, if it makes sense, is just to ask folks, um, you know, what any, any feedback, any input that they may have re with regards to the materials, um, uh, any thoughts about it, any questions, as well as also um, ask folks if anyone would like to, uh, you know, uh, be considered to volunteer uh, in the application process, so. Hey, Rico, this is Derek. It's so exciting to uh, know that we have 25 applications as of uh, this past uh, Tuesday. So a uh, quick thing is, uh, yeah, I'd like to be part of the uh, reviewer panel. So if you can include me, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Uh, excuse me, Rigo, may I ask a question? This is Cheryl Brown. Yes, please, Cheryl, go ahead. Um, do you have a date yet that we're going to, or a, and a procedure for us to go through those applications? Uh, the the only date that I could see is that uh, they were it, the eighteenth is the final day for application submissions, um, and uh, and then from there I we're going to be I think uh, you know looking to uh, Amanda CDA to really help uh, help us identify uh, some dates to go through that process. So Amanda, anything you'd like to comment there? I know once we have all of our volunteers, we can go ahead and set up a time that works for everyone. Um, I would, I'll share the criteria, the scoring criteria and the applications with you in advance, and then we can meet and discuss um, sometime within the next couple of weeks. You can send out a doodle poll. What's that? You know, the doodle poll. Oh, doodle poll, yes. Thanks, Cheryl. Great question. Um, Anyone, anyone else have any uh, comments or questions? Uh, and if you have an interest in uh, being part of the, um, the, the review team, uh, please uh, let us know. Can we say we're gonna miss you, by the way? <laughs> you talking <laughs> to me, <girl. laughs> uh, Do you ahead. want to share your news with everybody? Are you gonna share it or is, is uh, am I? <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Yes, let me let me go ahead and uh, and and just um, restate. Uh, 
there was a public announcement that was made on behalf of St. Barnabas, our board chair uh, announced and uh, let folks know that uh, after 13 years of leading uh, St. Barnabas Senior Services, I, um, I decided that I'm going to be stepping down as its president and CEO. Uh, and at the end of December of 2021, so there's uh, certainly a little bit more time uh, to get uh, to uh, to get some things done or to create more craziness, if you will. But mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so, but you know, I am. I want to be clear. I am not retiring. Uh, it's uh, it's a it's just. I feel it's a good time. Uh, St. Barnabas is in a very strong position uh, to the, have a new leader come on board with uh, fresh eyes and renewed energy. And for me to really uh, take this opportunity to explore uh, leadership uh, positions, opportunities that will give me a career challenge and personal professional growth. So look forward to that. Um, and of course, it'll be a decision to be made with this committee and my work here as, you know, as a representative of St. Barnabas, if, uh, you know, um, so happy to step aside in, in, when the time comes for with you know uh, when the new leader is on board, um, or find ways to continue to work with you. But that'll be something that certainly will be discussed uh, with all of you and and the folks at CDA. So, but um, yes, that's it. Um, anyway, didn't expect that, Cheryl. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm and, I'm sorry. Congratulations, I was so sorry. Rigo. <laughs> I was just so surprised when I saw it. I said, well, what's going on? And you didn't say anything. That's why I brought it up. So no, that's okay, elephant, Cheryl. That was the elephant in the room. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, thank you. No, not a problem. Obviously it's out for uh, public consumption. And, uh, and but again, it's just, uh, you know, I think it's a good time for the organization and myself. And, uh, and as I said, it's not a retirement. It's just a, a, a change in, in, you know, looking for new leadership opportunities. We go, but we still have to have a party. This is Marty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, well, you know, Marty, you know, I'm always open to a party, my friend. Good. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so any any other comments, observations about the recruitment process thus far. Uh, thank you, Derek. I know, you know, 25 is a good number. I think, uh, you know, again, uh, we have a couple more days. Uh, so uh, I, you know, get looking at a quick glance at the 25 applicants, uh, I think we feel pretty good that we have representation uh, that we're looking for, but certainly I can, can use, you know, perhaps a bit more. Um, Amanda, any, any comments you'd like to make? I think Donna has a comment. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just wanted to say, really encourage people to be part of the review process for this. Um, I think that the more uh, different viewpoints we have as we're looking through these applicants will make a, will yield the strongest people for our um, committee. So I would really, and you know what? We'll bring chocolate. We'll have chocolate somehow for everyone. <laughs> I'm gonna hold you to that, Donna. <laughs> All right. Um... Okay, so can we go to the uh, the next slide there? All right, and and then of course the other area is that uh, you know certainly we we recognize and acknowledge that there are other uh, work groups and committees in place uh, you know to carry out the work of the master plan for aging as well as CDA work in the planning and execution, um, and so there's going to be some opportunities for intersect and and ultimately what we like is an objective is to have uh, representation from this committee uh, in those other uh, committees and work groups and task forces so that we um, we're, we're intentional and assure that we have an equity lens as part of that process. Um, and so uh, perhaps at, at this time, um, I wanna see if there's anyone in our committee already in our advisory count, uh, committee that actually sits in one of these committees. Um, I believe, uh, Derek, you, you, you were recently um, um, asked to serve on the uh, Alzheimer's Advisory Committee, is that correct? Yeah, correct. I uh, have just been appointed to the Alzheimer's Advisory Committee. Congratulations to that, Derek. And uh, we're really excited to have you there and uh, really represent uh, um, 
you know, the equity lens uh, perspective uh, in that committee as well. So, um, and so we have Derek uh, in that. Any other, anyone else sit on that advice uh, uh, task force? Uh, Debbie is uh, on that committee, not the task force, but uh, she is uh, stepping mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I probably would look at the long term care insurance task force if no one else is uh, interested. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. Any other? volunteers for any of the other task force. Um, and also I think there's the broadband, right? Amanda, is there an opportunity for joining the broadband committee? Well, CDA does not have a seat on that, um, but of course, attending as a member of the public would be welcomed by anyone on this committee um, and reporting back. Um, okay. uh, Rigo, Marty yes, here. Um, the long-term care insurance task force, we're going to be talking about this work a little bit later in the agenda. Uh, I, I don't know if there's opportunity for the being on the task force, but I certainly am interested in continuing to be part of a comment process on that, if we can uh, engage, so to speak, with, <laughs> with that process. Right. And I think Leandra Clark is on the behavioral health committee or is the task force um yes i am uh yeah and so you know, we have quite a bit of work to do when it comes to behavioral health and older adults is there's a gap there in the services and attention for Thank older adults. Um, yeah so i think cda might have some updates soon on some work we're hoping thanks, thanks for highlighting that i appreciate it <laughs> i'm not on the elder justice coordinating council, but I am on the California Elder Justice Commission, and we have representatives from the um, CEJC who are on the coordinating council, so, or who will probably be on the coordinating council, so I'm indirectly, we always have equity issues that come up and then we can feed it to the members. Great, thank you, Donna. And, and and maybe at the risk of speaking out of turn, Amanda, I think I think what, what obviously we you know having and being represent you know representing the and having the equity lens and and in, in, uh, in these committees or task forces, um, perhaps we could also you know ask that you come back and share key highlights from those meetings with our group so that we can have an opportunity to not just become to be aware of what's going on and how they're thinking things through, but of an opportunity to provide feedback, which you could then take take back on our behalf. Um, I think that would be extremely um, helpful. Absolutely. Okay. So um, so again, we open it up. I believe we have at least one person representing us uh, in in uh, in each of these committees. Uh, if there are other folks who want to serve in that particular kind of role or capacity, please let us know. Uh, we'd really appreciate it. And then I know that the, the broadband one is uh, outside of um, our sphere of influence, so to speak, but I think we'll be critical if we could find uh, someone um, and, and, and I'm happy to see if I, if I could sit in some of those meetings. Uh, if anyone else would like to join in, I think it would be great because obviously the digital divide is a major issue. Uh, and so it'd be good to be part of that. Um, Okay, and I think the only other point, Amanda, that I want that we wanted to just uh, potentially the converse, uh, the discuss is the amount of times that we want to meet as a, as a group um, in terms of meetings. I know we have suggested that we meet uh, quarterly. Um, that seems to be an appropriate uh, number of times uh, where there's there's time there's opportunity to do get other work done in between, and then come back and have plenty to discuss and really go over. And then, of course, I'm sure that if the need, if there's a, a need be to bring people together ad hoc committee to because of the timing wise, I think we could be leave that open for the possibility of making that happen. Um, so uh, any, any, you know, any, um, any thoughts or, 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 uh, you know, about maybe not, you know, in agreement that it should be quarterly. Um, any other perspectives on that? I think that's a 
I think that's a good amount of time. That's that gives you the the um, you can work in between the um, the meetings. Right now, I think meetings are on top of meetings, or they were not so much now, but meetings were on top of meetings, and sometimes you uh, can't even keep it straight. So mm -hmm. orderly sounds good to me. All right, Cheryl. Thank you. Anyone have an opposing view? If if not, then we can, you know, I think uh, just keep to that and uh, and uh, and agree that that's how we're gonna, you know, pace ourselves, if you will. Okay, so I think you know, I think we um, we are ready to go, and I'm gonna then hand it uh, over to uh, to Marty and Donna. Okay, I think Donna's gonna start it off. Yeah. Or maybe Amanda's going to start it off. No, Amanda's going to start it off. There we go. There we go. Can't get my Zoom to work correctly. Okay. Yes. So next agenda item, this opportunity to apply an equity lens to the long-term care insurance task force's work. Um, the insurance task force was announced a few months back, and Director McCoy Wade is um, on that committee. Uh, on this task force. And so it's the intent um, of the legislature to enact legislation to, to create this task force. And they are charged with exploring the feasibility of developing and implementing a culturally competent, keywords there, statewide insurance program for long-term care services and supports. Um, in addition to Kim, um, there are several people who represent the aging world on this task force. You can see on here, we have um, Eileen Coons from Onlon, Onlock Senior Health Services. We also have Blanca Castro from AARP. Um, so um, they have met twice now and shared some of, they've begun developing their work products and workflows. And Kim thought it'd be a great idea. Um, next slide to um, offer the expertise of the equity work group or what is now the equity and aging advisory committee um, to apply an equity lens to, to the work that they're doing um, on ensuring that everyone has access to this long-term care um, coverage, care insurance program, and also explore the options for the design of the program, including the eligibility, the enrollment benefits, the financing, administration, in its interaction with the Medi-Cal program and other publicly funded sources. Um, you know, the meetings are of course open to the public and you can access the materials on their website. But of course, you know, we had the long-term supports and services subcommittee provide input to the administration in the development of the master plan for aging. So I thought it best to hand this topic over to our in-house experts. Um, we have Donna Benton and Marty Lynch, who served on that stakeholder subcommittee, joining us to walk us through this potential activity for the committee. And then I also invited Carrie Graham, our consultant to the MPA, um, to join this conversation as well, because this is definitely her wheelhouse. Um, so I'm going to hand it over. Next slide, please. I'm going to hand it over to Donna. Thank you so much. Um, you know, as as we said, this is really a, a, a good opportunity and what we, I'm really happy that the long-term care committee, uh, the long-term care insurance task force reached out to our committee for our feedback. Um, but, and all the materials they sent, it's going to, you know, we could, we have a lot of opportunity to help make sure that there's an equity lens as they're um, going through and thinking about the different top priorities. So I'm going to start here with um, our what we identified in terms of uh, our top priorities for the LTSS subcommittee report that came out in 2020. Um, first, as you can see, we came out with five recommendations, and that was the a system that all Californians can navigate. And again, thinking through the equity lens, um, all Californians means um, a, a lifespan approach to this. And, and so we want to make sure that that is also what we'll be looking at from the long-term care insurance task force. Objective two is access to LTSS in every com community. Uh, we want it to be affordable uh, along with choices, have high value and high quality workforce. Sometimes this gets overlooked when um, we're trying to develop and think about LTSS uh, programs. 
And then fifth, we really felt that it was important that state and local administrative structures are in place so that there's some level of accountability. I'm sorry if I'm going too fast, accountability. Um, the strategy is we want to build, bridge the healthcare with the home, and which means that overall we're looking at um, advocating for from the federal level to create the LTSS benefits, or uh, are looking at plans and models that help to increase access to LTSS supports for people receiving Medicare only. So this is tapping into that group that sometimes is we're calling the missing middle. This became an important bridge for the healthcare to home. We also wanna look at the plans um, to make sure that they are developing kind of innovative models to make sure that the access and support uh, are, are for really people that could also be duals and also in incorporating those structures in partnerships with stakeholders. Absolutely need that stakeholder involvement. And also under initiative 36, we want to have these um, home and community-based services, making sure that we extend it to people who receive Medi-Cal. So again, that's that equity lens and maybe looking at this through the Cal Ames um, model. And this was part of the proposals through the budget. So I think some of these things have started to come through and I'm not gonna read the full list of what the in lieu of services are right now. Um, next slide, please. So what was presented to us from the Long-Term Care Insurance Task Force? Um, they gave us a work breakdown and things to consider. This is very hard to read. You probably, you know, there's, there's a lot of information here, but it is in a, this is a draft. And it's not, at this point, as they said, it's not meant to be comprehensive, but a good starting point for both their task force, but also for us to look at the equity lens. In particular, you can note that on the far, what's my um, right side under the terms access, they have clearly stated that they want to make sure access has equity and that there's also um, diversity of needs and interests, which and there's consumer rights are protected under there. So that, I think that's where they began to think around the equity lens and they're pulling that under access. But it's also important to look from all the way across from structure, financing, considerations, workforce, services, all of these do map to the recommendations, but we want to make sure that the equity, as we always say, it's baked into every um, column that we're looking at on this uh, uh, worksheet right now. Um, I'm going to go ahead on the next slide just so that we can look at some sample questions. So what are the needs um, based on our tool, we always say what are the needs and gaps and organizational barriers that need to, uh, that might be there to within this plan? Uh, what are some of the basic organizational barriers to equity and determined when designing the recommendation policy or programs? And that's kind of why they're bringing that to us. And do the policies and programs take into account, take into account cultural and language differences uh, differences in the communities and their needs, and how will the research inform the policies, programs, and strategies that are being presented? So, um, okay, we're not on a break yet. <laughs> now we just <laughs> talk. <laughs> so let's go back for, um, go back one slide, please, before this ensuring, back to the, the chart. You also received, I think everyone did get the, um, other three pages, or it's not three, but other three attachments right. that go into a little more detail across each of these columns that present um, all of the potential ways the plan for LTSS could be implemented through a, a public-private partnership, private-only, um, governmental, uh, governmental reimbursements. And so those are also part of the plan. There's a lot of material there, and I'm going to turn it over to Marty after I finish this. Um, there's a lot of material to review, and 
my suggestion at this point is that I think it would be good for us to have a discussion now, but also to have a subcommittee that really can go a little more into each of these columns, into all of the attachments that we received, and from there, um, write a letter back to the LTCI task force. So Marty, I'm gonna turn it over to you to um, lead the discussion Thanks. and- Okay, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Donna, that was great. Appreciate you going through all that. Um, and it is complex, mind you, if you haven't been you know, involved in this. There's a couple of things that I wanted to point out uh, uh, just to get us started. Number one, I think both at the Stakeholder Advisory Committee uh, and the Master Plan in general, we called out universal access to LTSS and some type of a uh, uh, let's call it an insurance plan or a public insurance plan that would make that possible and uh, with equity built in, right? So I think that's kind of the big picture goal. And then we get down to some of these details about how to accomplish that. I think some of the uh, decision points in the LTCI task force work are about public benefits versus, versus private, uh, private public benefits versus hybrids. And of course, I always think from an equity point of view that our low income and diverse populations often rely so much on the public benefit programs that you know I always get worried about whether any kind of private option will really be accessible to that part of our population. So I'll just note my prejudice right up front that you know I'm interested in seeing us make progress on public benefit. Then I would say a couple other things. Uh, CalAIM is going forward right now. So these discussions about enhanced care management and in lieu of services, and eventually the public plans having duals, what are called DSTIP plans, uh, those and manage long-term services and supports, those are all pretty interesting and an opportunity for input right now in how the Medi-Cal program will move forward specifically with the duals. So that's in front of us. The other thing that's in front of us that I think this plan calls out, which is really a good thing, is the uh, what Donna just called the missing middle or the Medicare only population. So these are typically folks who are on Medicare don't qualify for Medi-Cal. And remember, um, uh, we'd love to see that day when the asset test gets eliminated from Medi-Cal eligibility. But right now, we have people that don't qualify for Medi-Cal as supplemental, but don't have a whole lot of resources. So this whole idea of supporting efforts to build long-term services and support somehow into the Medicare plans and the Medicare fee-for-service world, which this new Medicare Innovation and Integration Office that, that we hope is coming up once the budget is approved, you know, that's a tremendous opportunity. So I think it's our chance in the equity group to give feedback that's gonna, we hope will impact and color all of that. So uh, Donna, if it's okay with you, why don't we open it up and see where people are going and what people are thinking about on the committee? And you know, that's what I would say, though, is some of the overriding points uh, after Donna goes through the details. So, uh, Amanda, can we open it up for comment? Oh yeah, for sure. Um, anyone has anything to add to the conversation? You're welcome to just go ahead and raise your hand if you'd like. There, Denny. I see Denny. Hi everyone, sorry I was late. I was on a, I was presenting at another conference, um, but really happy I joined for at least this part of the conversation. Um, I had a couple of reactions. I have not done a deep dive on the documents that were sent out. Um, so I did skim them, but haven't reviewed them closely. Um, but a couple of thoughts I had was one, I think it's really important when we think about baking equity in to be able to be, to be, able to measure that easily um, through benchmarks or some sort of data in our experience in trying to get data just on the Medi-Cal side for, for low-income older adults on HCBS programs, it's often difficult to get a sense of um, whether those services are being provided equitably. 
So I think as we as I see the sort of multiple blue buckets, like is there something around data that um, as we're building out a new program and improving old ones, um, can we make sure that data is seamless and easy for us to get so that if we want to be able to know, you know, are certain communities being equitably served through HCBS, we can get that, we can get those numbers easily. Um, I, I also had one thought, another additional thought was around the missing middle um, population. And if we're building out a new system for them, you know, how does that system compare to the system for low income folks? And I have questions about whether the quality that people get <laughs> varies, whether they're in the missing middle or if they're in, or if they're on Medi-Cal. And so I want people to have the same access, um, that access isn't just access to HCBS, but that that access looks the same regardless of your income. Um, and then I was just gonna ask a practical question, Donna, which is uh, you had suggested that you had wanted a couple of us to do a deeper dive and write a letter back. And I'm just wondering what the timeline is. I'm interested in these issues, happy to help, but also don't have a ton of bandwidth immediately. So if there's a flexible-ish timeline, I'd be happy to, to be involved. Yeah. yeah. Um, Donna, I don't know if you know the answer. I don't think. Uh, I didn't Amanda, get a timeline. <laughs> yeah, Amanda, did you have a timeline for us on this? No, I, I think it's flexible. Um, I mean, I would like to, to get it in within the next four weeks, three to four weeks. Oh. Okay. Yeah, definitely before their next meeting. Let's uh -huh. see. I can pull that date up in a second. Yeah. Denny, I do like your comments on data and the need to understand what's actually going on out there with these services, right. which I, yeah, that's good. While Amanda's looking for the um, next date, which would uh, be helpful, I see Carrie has her hand up. Hi, all. Um, I, I guess I just wanted to, to build on Marty's point about the structure of the program and that I think so many equity considerations are, would be built into how a program like this is structured. Um, we know programs that that simply encourage people to save more tend to be something that that only wealthier people are able to participate in. Um, on the other hand, we know that the Class Act federally didn't work well because it was voluntary, and so you had adverse selection; and it became too expensive. So I would say, you know, there's a lot here on this slide. Um, but focusing on the equity implications of the structure of any potential long-term care insurance plan in California, I think would be really a great place to start. Um, I also think just kind of pointing out that there's a lot of talk federally about what to do about long-term care insurance and, and, and all of that. And it would just be, I know that they're looking closely at Washington. Um, to, they need some examples of what works. They need some case studies from the states and it, and it would be, I, I think, really, really valuable to, and I know very bold for California to come out there as a state that's, that's trying to do something along these lines and it would get a lot of federal attention. And I don't know if there's any thoughts around a CMMI demo or, or something like that, that that California could try to try to advocate for as well. So just a few of my thoughts. Yeah, Carrie, that's, that's helpful, I think. Uh, Danny, could I ask you one other question uh, that follows up a little bit on what Carrie is saying? Uh, so you worried about equity, I think, between uh, or among different products, like uh, if you want to call them products, coverages like Medi-Cal versus something that might be built onto Medicare. Uh, I got to tell you that my assumption is you couldn't, you couldn't achieve equity unless you could qualify everyone who needed these services for a Medi-Cal-like benefit. That it's very hard to imagine how a Medicare add-on, which might be better than what we have today, would be equitable to a full Medi-Cal benefit but maybe I'm not thinking about it right. So I wanted to ask you or maybe Carrie or Donna to see if either one of any of you had comments on that. Uh, 
So just to clarify, Marty, you're saying that you you think doing this through Medicaid would be more equitable than doing it as more of a Medicare benefit? Well, if you have a, what I'm saying is if you have a Medi-Cal, Medicaid, uh, LTSS benefit already in place that money's being spent on, that it's hard to match that with just some add-ons to Medicare fee-for-service or Medicare Advantage. You know, that they probably by their nature are going to be lesser benefits and therefore inequitable in some ways. Uh, but I wanted to see if I was missing something and how Danny was thinking about this or whether you might comment on that or whether Donna had thoughts on that, you know, or others. Yeah. Does that make sense, Carrie? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I think it really depends on what the Medicare benefit is, you know. Yeah, um, certainly. If it's sort of a, 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 a Medigap plan available to all or, or um, you know, I, on the other hand, there could be like a Medicaid buy-in sort of a plan. But I, and, you know, I think there's a lot of worry here. I mean, a, a lot of what I think people focus on is that people on Medicaid do have access to some LTSS. Whereas the forgotten middle are um, don't have really anything, so um, there's just different ways to look, slice and dice it, and and think about equity. And and when we think about the Medicare population, we have to remember that the average income is about twenty to twenty two thousand dollars a year. The, you know, the um, there are certainly low income people in the Medicare only population too. Right. I, I think also, Marty, to your point, um, I think what you're saying is that there should be a common floor for everyone. And then, and maybe that's what you're trying to say, Denny. I mean, to me, it feels like that the equity that you're discussing is, you know, having a, a common floor for everyone of mm -hmm. benefits and services. But I mean, Denny, it was your statement, so I want to speak for you. Yeah, I, I appreciate the opportunity to clarify. I, it's interesting, Marty, because I, I hear you and understand your point around how that would be inequitable for Medicare only folks if you're trying to just sort of hop something onto um, the Medicare program. I was a little more worried about the, the reverse, okay. um, that if you build out a really great program for the forgotten middle, that people who are on Medi-Cal might just be stuck with um, a lesser system, um, and the system looks a lot better for people who might not have a ton of resources, but have more resources such that they can't be on the Medi-Cal program. That was sort of my point, and I think we see it, I was just thinking a lot about our duals experience in duals advocacy where, and it's not in the long-term care context, but like there are a lot of providers, you know, people who are on the Medicare program have a lot more access to providers than typically on the Medi-Cal program depending on the service. So I could just see that playing out and I wouldn't want lower income folks on Medi-Cal to have a lesser LTSS system than whatever ends up being built out. That was my point. Got it, okay. Yeah, it's funny how we are starting it the opposite ways. Yeah, that's good. Good to talk it out. Um, anyone else who really wanna hear from the committee? I, I know, as I said, this is a lot to digest, but um, I think we all, Oh, Jeffrey, go ahead. Thanks, uh, thanks Donna. Can appreciate a, a good logic model. Um, I had a question around, you know, maybe this is more um, beyond the scope of this particular work, but how does the task force interact with uh, DHCS's ongoing conversations with Cal AIM? You know, I know that there's some discussions in, in, in Cal AIM around around long-term care, you know, carve-outs, carve-ins. Carve I'm just curious if anyone had any context on that. And I'm curious um, whether there's a robust community engagement process, particularly with the types of services and thinking about California, um, you know, we are gonna be, our, our aging population is gonna be a browner population moving forward. So how do we build in some of, the, some of these services that maybe we haven't envisioned yet? for um, particularly communities of color, immigrant communities. Uh, I'm just curious about that. Uh, 
Um, I mean, I'm, I'll take a crack, Donna, at what I know about Cal AIM, and then uh, right. others may be able to chime in. Uh, I think DHGS would probably claim that they have a decent stakeholder process. Now, I don't think that the stakeholder process is so much about equity concerns as it is about design of these different pieces of the Cal AIM benefit, although maybe some of the stakeholders at the table might bring up equity concerns. So I think you know, there's probably some room to work with them on you know, the ICL, ILOS, the ECM, you know, these different, different uh, benefit pieces in Cal AIM. Um, and I haven't, the long-term care transition where they are transitioning management of long-term care as in nursing home, custodial nursing home services to the health plans uh, from the state. You know, today, in depending on what county you're in, in many counties, you get disenrolled from the health plan, the Medicaid health plan, and, you know, the state handles the meta, handles the nursing home side of the benefit. That's going to get transferred. Uh, to the health plans shortly. So I haven't heard a whole lot of discussion about the equity concerns there, but one could imagine issues like COVID and infection control in the nursing home settings and workforce issues in the nursing home settings. All of a sudden, the locus of contracting control is going to shift to local health plans where some of us may have more influence and some maybe less, I'm not sure. So uh, uh, Jeffrey, I'm not sure if I'm getting at your question, but that's what I see going on so far. You know, Donna, do you have, can you add or Carrie or Danny, anybody else on the phone can add on that or on the committee? I, I know I can't. I know Cheryl has her hand up, so um, she might address it, but I think it might be a different question altogether. Um, I Mine think again, we, oh, Denny, do you want to add address that? Are you having? I was your just going to say something really quick in response about the Calain question. Um, that I think one of the issues about Calain in general is that it's huge, and so it's going to be really important for us to identify what specific changes we're talking about under Calain and the implications for older adults of color in particular. Like that's Jeffrey. Like I appreciate your question. I also think it's like. We need to be, are we talking about the, you know, to Marty's point, are we talking about the transition of the long-term care benefit to Medi-Cal managed care across the state? Are we talking about the DSNP stuff? Are we, you know, what piece of, in lieu of services? So I think all that has a lot of potential opportunities to be thinking about equity. And to Marty's point, like, I'm not sure the state's starting there, <laughs> even if other people are bringing it up. So. I think it's an important area of work for us, you know, to the extent that we can be working with DHCS and others, um, because it's such a large piece. And I think even if we identify maybe three or four big changes under CalAIM and really drill down on what the equity implications are for older adults, like that to me is success because the, the whole thing by itself, CalAIM is so sprawling that we could really be, I mean, that could take over the work of this committee moving forward. And I think we want to be mindful of that. You know, I think that he really. Uh, I, I, Marty, I mean, if you want to go back, but we have Cheryl who's had her hand up for a little while. Yeah, yeah, no, I got it. I, uh, Donna, can I just, I'm just going to write on this point, which is simply that um, uh, Cal AIM is sprawling, Denny is right, and there's opportunity. Um, I lost my train, of, my train of thought. Sorry, I'll come back to it. Cheryl, you'll help me. Go ahead, Cheryl. <laughs> I'm sorry. sorry. No, that's I'm okay. sorry. Yeah. I, I no, just wasn't your wanted, fault. I was looking at financing under the column that says financing. Uh -huh. And and what I've been asking all along is can we have a benefit that would be the share of cost? And I see it's here, but whenever I talk to people about it, so that it's like a sliding scale, if you make if you make um Let's say if you make $100 and someone else makes $10, the sliding scale would work it out so that you won't, you will still be able to have a service. And I know this is very simplistic, that you'll still be able to have a service and that the other person who makes the $10, uh, they, would, they can have the service as well. But the service 
would be a sliding scale or a share of cost rather than, um, I think right now, if you're trying to get somebody to come in and take care of a loved one into your home, it's like $30 an hour. Who can afford that? Right, right. Thank you. You know, That's and fine. again, that goes, that, that addresses equity across incomes. Michael, you had your hand up. Oh, I think Leandra first and then Michael. Yeah, and then Donna, bring me back after those two. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Donna. I appreciate it. Um, so I, I wanted to just circle back just to close the loop a little bit on the CalWAM. I sit on one of the work groups. And so there was a population health work group, which did drill down on some health equity issues in general. But I think we also have to be mindful that that CalAIM stakeholder process has closed. Like there, it's not an open process. Like those groups were a while back. But I do think where we could potentially impact is the ILOS and ECM because they actually modeled that after the work that's done, you know, really well and understandably with um, older adults in that population. So it's clear to me that the state pursued that based on what they thought was working well kind of on, on our side over here. So I think that there's opportunities still there to go back and say, you know, as you design that, like I think it may have been Diddy that talked about drilling down. Um, so I think that those are really the areas for opportunity because we can demonstrate that there's expertise in being able to provide those services um, to DHCS who has not done the ILOS and ECM before. So I'll stop there. But. Okay, um, thank you, Leandra. Michael? Thank you. Just a quick question. Perhaps this is um, understood and baked in, but as I listen to this conversation, the um, need to be really thoughtful about the education um, component of this and the audience is impacted by it. It does have under access quality responsive services and navigation of LTSS. But as this work evolves, what is it that's going to be needed to translate this type of benefit or the impact to what people currently have so they understand their options um, regardless of uh, background and culture as we, as we move forward? Okay. I'm already hearing some excellent ideas and responses that we could put together. So uh, I think we have gone past our time that would have been the break time. Oh, Marty, I forgot. Thank you, Marty. You're supposed yeah. to come back. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Donna. Yeah, I just wanted to, in response still to Jeffrey's question, which is really, you know, the issue of the group in a lot of ways. If you talk to JC Cooper, who's the Medi-Cal director, or if you talk to Will Lightborn, who's the DHCS director, both of them would say one of their priorities under Cal AIM is to reduce disparities and create equity in the Medi-Cal program. So I just wanna give them the credit, like integrated behavioral health care, they would say that those are some of the major directions of Cal AIM. Now, I think at the level of detail that we're gonna dive into, I don't know what's going on there, but at the goal level, we'll give them some credit. We should give them credit for identifying those goals, uh, including equity and eliminating disparities. Thanks, Donna. Okay, thanks. So as I was about to say, um, given our time and probably a need for a break, um, maybe we could take a break and when we come back, which gives everyone a chance to feel um, free and open. When you come back, we would like to see some volunteers uh, because you'll be rested. If I ask you now, you just want to go on your break. So we'll ask for volunteers <laughs> after the break. That's great. How long, Donna, for the break? I don't know because um, <laughs> I don't know. Amanda. Let's make it quick. We're a little behind schedule. So if a quick stand break, maybe two minutes. Can we all come back at 321? 321. Okay. Thanks. So before we go to COVID, I'd like to, I think, um, if anybody wants to raise their hand right now, who would be willing to help draft um, our reply to the long-term care insurance task force, the materials that we received. 
Um, Cheryl. Cheryl, Marty, Denny, we have a month. <laughs> I don't know if that's enough time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. By the way, the next meeting is August 19th. Oh, we have more than a month. Yeah. Okay, we got Denny and I saw Derek. Denny, Derek, Marty. Anyone else? I, I can't see if you're raising your hand. My screen's kind of small. So if you're not using the little icon and you, you can just unmute yourself and say, please include me. Okay. Well, we have Donna, it looks Donna. like Michael's interested as well. And Michael. Right. Yeah. Great. Donna, can we assume we get you too? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be all you guys. You guys just go in there and do it. <laughs> okay. Teaching. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, no, you don't. <laughs> but you got Cheryl. <laughs> right. <Dang>. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. 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 Donna's bringing the chocolates, so she's in. Who is? You are. You're bringing the chocolates. Oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. Me and my big mouth. Yes, I'm in. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, uh, Marty and Donna, for leading the discussion. And for our volunteers, we can follow up afterward. Um, but we should move along to our next agenda item, which is the COVID-19 response vaccines and equity discussion. So Denny Chan will be sharing some of uh, the background and the data on vaccines and equity. And then Connie is going to share a bit about CDA's outreach activities. Go ahead, take it away, Denny. Next slide. Hi everyone, um, thank you so much. Um, and thank you to Amanda. Um, so what you see, I give you a little bit of background first. I think we've talked about this in previous meetings. Um, we are, we have officially reopened right as of yesterday, uh, the state of California, um, but we are still in a journey of vaccinating um, many Californians, including older adults and older adults of color in particular. Um, I had the opportunity along with several other folks like Jeffrey to sit on the Community Vaccine Advisory Committee for the state of California, um, which is a group that was impaneled to give advice and feedback about equitable distribution and access to the vaccines for the state. Um, and in those meetings, I had asked repeatedly, can we get some data around, you know, older adults were eligible starting in January. Can we get some data around older adults um, that was specific and broken down by racial groups in terms of vaccine um, vaccination rates? Because if you go on the general CDPH website, we only have um, vaccination rates by race and we have vaccination rates by age, but we don't have, at the intersection of those two things, we don't know what's happening. Um, so as I said, older adults have been um, eligible for the vaccine by and large um, since January, starting in long-term care facilities and then moving on to older adults in the community. Um, and this data, the infamous slide 24, is from a May meeting of the Community Vaccine Advisory Committee. So this is at least as current as of May. Um, we've had some follow-up discussions with CDPH, um, the California Department of Public Health, um, about the data. And so we've been told that there have been some improvements, but we haven't, um, we don't have a lot of detail. We haven't seen updated data yet. Um, so what I want to highlight is a couple of things. One is that um, and we're gonna set aside the 12 to 19 year old folks because of um, eligibility issues. I don't think that's quite, you know, a, a, first our focus population, right? Um, and also they haven't been eligible since January. Um, but if you look across the age bands, you will notice that older adults, especially when you start looking at 60 up, 70 and up and 80 and up, they are tending to be vaccinated less than their younger counterparts. Um, and that's true for mo many of the different racial groups across California. Um, you can see sort of larger bumps and then it sort of levels off as you get older. And then what I, the other trend I wanna sort of draw your particular attention to is really on um, for specific for Latino older adults, 
um, despite the fact that like the older adults have been eligible since January, we see that you know in the 60 to 69 category, it hovers around 40 percent. But then when you jump to 70 to 79, it looks like that might be even a little north of 30 percent. We don't have raw numbers here. We just have to try and interpret the, the bars. Um, and then 80 plus, you know, we're like a little north of 20 percent. Um, and so. I'm gonna take CDPH, the California Department of Public Health, I'm gonna take them at their word that there have been improvements, but I think that these statistics and these bars suggest to me that there's a lot of work left to do. Um, and what I've told members of the CBAC and CDPH, the, Cal the California Department of Public Health and the Vaccine Advisory Committee is that we may not be at a point now that we run out of hospital beds, but if all the hospital beds are filled with older Latino adults, that's still an emergency and that's still a problem. Um, so I wanted to flag this all for you and I wanted us to do some brainstorming. We invited CDPH, the California Department of Public Health to come. Um, they weren't able to come today um, because I wanted to get them some feedback on what's going on. But my sort of general impression is that they have a strategy for older adults, maybe. They have a strategy for populations of color, communities of color, but I'm not sure they have strategies at that intersection. And so I'm really hoping that we can help um, both CDPH and the California Department of Aging fill this gap, um, because to me, there's a lot of work left to do. Um, and I know that Connie is gonna talk a little bit more about what CDA is doing, and so maybe it makes sense, Connie, for you to talk a little bit about CDA's efforts, and then we can go into some general discussion with the group, because I also know we have, we have less time maybe than we originally anticipated. Yeah, thanks, Denny, for that. Um, so kind of piggybacking off of some of the data that um, Denny has kind of pointed out, um, you know, so CDA is, is um, uh, COVID-19 vaccine outreach campaign that we've been working on. Um, can you guys go to the next slide? Uh, next slide. Okay. Um, so some of that data also pointed out that 76% of 65 plus older Californian population we serve have received at least one dose of the vaccine um, and at least 63% are fully vaccinated. But what we're trying to reach are the ones that have not been vaccinated yet, because that is a very vulnerable population. Um, adults 65 plus make up 73% of all the COVID deaths um, that were accounted for in California. And of those deaths, almost 70% of those deaths are from communities of color when you start to really take a look at the data. Um, equity gaps in the vaccine rates in older adults persist, especially in the Latino, Black, Native American, and other communities of color. So what our outreach campaign has sought to do was to take a look at the data and target the zip codes with low vaccination rates and high population of adults 65 plus. Um, our COVID outreach campaign, uh, we're using federal funds. Um, uh, these funds are um, CDA, AAA, and ADRC for older adult vaccine outreach. Um, the funding that is allotted for this is you'll see the area agencies on aging is about 5.2 million. And for the ADRCs are about 1.5. Some of the amount is going towards our statewide campaign um, for the outreach. And then the other funds are also being dispersed locally for their own local outreach as well. Next slide. So part of CDA's statewide outreach, uh, we've got a few different approaches we're utilizing. Um, first, our ethnic media briefings. Um, mm -hmm. So we really want to work closely with the ethnic media to make sure that these messages uh, go out um, in terms of addressing vaccine hesitancy and also addressing vaccine access. Um, we held our first of three ethnic media briefings. Uh, the first one was actually just held last Tuesday on the 8th. Um, we had about... Uh, 80 different media outlets representing African-American, Afro-Caribbean, Arabic, Armenian, Chinese, Filipino, Indian, Indonesian, Korean, Latino, Native American, 
Russian, Thai, and Vietnamese. We got uh, some pretty good media coverage out of the ethnic briefing. Um, about 26 stories ran. Uh, it's about 18 online stories and eight broadcast stories uh, that we've been able to track to date. And those languages included um, African-American, Arabic, Chinese, Indian, Korean, Latino, Russian, and Vietnamese. Um, the speakers that we had, we had a, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, just really briefly, um, the panel, we had a great panel of speakers. It included Director Kim McCoy Wade from the California Department of Aging, Dr. Luis uh, Aronson, um, author and geriatrician, uh, Annie Chung, Executive Director of Self Help for the Elderly, Cindy Cox Roman, CEA of Help Age USA, and also Jessica Lehman, Executive Director of Senior and Disability Action. Next slide. In addition to the ethnic media briefings, we've also launched a broadcast radio campaign. Um, it's important that we're looking at these broadcast channels. Um, so uh, this sends the message out to people that don't have access to internet and don't do this streaming TV that has uh, really now taken over as a large percentage or large share of those um, and how they consume the media. So broadcast radio is one of the media outlets that we're using. Markets that we were covering uh, include Chico, Fresno, Modesto, Redding, Riverside San Bernardino, Sacramento, Stockton, and Visalia, Tulare, and Hanford. Our approach is using broadcast influencers throughout California to use live air, on air reads and also organic social media to raise awareness about the vaccine incentive program. Um, we're seeking to establish these relationships with the media outlets so that we can access their on-air talent to be our trusted messenger uh, to del deliver these messages. Next slide. Additional channels we'll look at rolling into our media campaign um, as we start digging deeper into um, the research is direct mail. The, these direct mail pieces will be targeted to certain individuals and communities. Uh, broadcast television is also one that we want to look at. Um, it will mirror markets of radio. Um, we'll also utilize broadcast talent as trusted messengers through PSAs and additional ethnic media outreach. Um, so we're going to work closely with them and collaborate with them to serve as a community conduit, working with community-based organizations to promote vaccine messaging and efforts, and also additional ethnic media briefings and paid ethnic media placements. There's also uh, grants to both local um, AAAs and ADRCs for targeted outreach. Um, these will be informed by the priorities of codes we're looking at. The 75 zip codes were identified by CDPH with the lower vaccination rates and higher population of older adults. Um, reports on activities and outcomes will be shared as we move uh, further into this development. So I think we really wanted to open up for a discussion with members of the committee on both, you know, questions that you all have, but also what are some ideas? You know, I think it's clear that if we continue to do what we've done since January, we will end up in the same place. Um, so I think that, you know, to the extent that you have ideas, interesting thoughts, I think we're all really open. Thank you, Connie, for sharing a lot of the work the CDA has been doing. I'll also mention that we have next week, we have our final um, community vaccine advisory committee meeting. And I'm happy to share, I'm, I'm not sure how much time we'll get. There's like 60, 70 people on the committee um, in only two hours, but to the extent that I have time, I'm happy to share ideas there in that platform as well. Derek, I see your hands up. Yeah, thank you, Danny. Uh, Connie, it's great to know that uh, there's a uh, very elaborate uh, campaign to send the PSA. I just want to mention that uh, my family has been watching a lot of uh, Chinese dramas uh, through uh, Apple TV and there are already PSAs in Chinese and they're featuring uh, UCSF and also Unlock the Physicians to basically explain why uh, you know individuals should go for vaccination even though they have any doubts. So I think it's working in the Chinese community. Just want to point that out. Thank you. Michael. Hey, Connie, thank you so much. Um, 
wondered if there's been some consideration and maybe built in some of the CBO conversations around faith-based strategy and opportunities to work with the diocese or other groups um, across um, faith-based organizations as a trusted uh, voice in the community. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Michael. And that's definitely something that we're looking into, um, especially when we get more into working with the ethnic media outlets. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna be taking a look at each community because um, each community is unique and they have their own um, you know nuances in terms of how they consume their information. And there are those communities that where the faith based organizations are a big part of the community. So we'll be working in conjunction with them. Any other questions or comments or suggestions for um, COVID outreach? If not, I think we can turn it over to the next item on the agenda. I thought maybe Jeffrey had his hand raised. I don't know if okay. that was an accident or, or not. So Jeffrey, if you, the floor is yours if you wanna say something. Thanks, Denny. Um, thanks, Connie, for, for that presentation. Uh, not an accident. Um, I just um, having some tech issues. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, um, for sharing all this information. You know, I think many of the stakeholders that have been part of the CVAC have been following, you know, some of the many of the conversations, many of them hard conversations that have happened um, with uh, the vaccine rollout. And really, you know, I think an understanding that we're we're developing this new system for allocation uh, of of the vaccines and still operating within a social, economic, political context that leaves many of our um, older adults of color out. Um, I I am interested um, whether this information is something you can share with us, Connie. Um, and I'm thinking about uh, some of the federal funds that are coming down the pike, um, HRSA. Um, is pretty close to announcing some additional um, investments uh, uh, for education outreach. So, you know, I think we're getting to the point where we need to be extremely creative and innovative with reaching the hardest reach uh, members of our communities. And uh, while the state is reopening, our work isn't done yet. And I think the data show that. Jeffrey, do you want to clarify who HRSA is before we hear from Marty? Absolutely. Um, HRSA is a, and someone correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the Healthcare Resources and Services Administration, uh, they're a federal agency and they coordinate a lot of the grants for uh, federally qualified health centers, lookalikes, um, and do a lot of investments in our healthcare workforce. Thank you. Marty. Uh, yeah, thanks, Danny. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask, I, I don't know if you covered it before and I missed it, but how about what we know about homebound older folks and vaccinations being delivered in home settings? Uh, do we have reports or data that show us where that's going and what the uh, racial breakdowns might be on that? Um, so as you can imagine, the state, um, the the at-home vaccination program across the state. So local health jurisdictions may have had their own programs, but the statewide program really wasn't in effect until probably sometime in April. Um, and so I have heard through the grapevine that we have not gotten any data. Um, and so it'll be, if it's taken us this long to get the race data <laughs> for older adults generally in the community, it, it, we might need a little bit more time before we are able to get the data on the at-home um, at home vaccinations is also as a parallel, the transportation requests that have gone in through my turn. Um, both of those were launched around the same time. And I know that a number of advocates have been asking for that data. I have not seen that data yet. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I noticed uh, back, you know, I am retired from a federally qualified health center funded by HRSA. Uh, and we, of course, were doing at Lifeline, we're doing homebound uh, uh, vaccines uh, early on before the state program. But I just heard that there's both been a lot of demand and 
we've run out of enough staffing to keep it going. So we've had to take a hiatus in it. So, you know, I'm just, when we have it, I'd love to see what's going on around the state on a more systematic uh, level. Thank you. Um, this is Cheryl Brown. I brought that up to, um, to Kim some time ago because we had people who were uh, writing in saying that there was nobody to help them. They were homebound. They could not get out of the bed. Um, it was a really bad situation. Kim said she was gonna start working on it and she did. Now in San Bernardino at the IEHP, they will send someone to the home and that's in San, that's the largest provider in San Bernardino County. And they'll send someone to a, a senior's home to vaccinate them. And I just wanted to add right. that there's movement, but whether it's on the needle and it's, you know, whether it's something that they've been able to, um, to pull the data on, that's the biggest problem. And that I know, Denny, is what you're talking about. Uh huh. Thank you. If there are no other questions, I'm happy to do another update on this particular sort of COVID response um, at our next quarterly meeting, um, but happy to also move on to the next item on the agenda since I know we have limited time. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Danny and Connie. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Michael Murray, who will open up the floor for member updates. Thank you, everyone. Wow, what a, a great dialogue uh, today. And I do want to be mindful of time when we've heard from a lot of folks today. Um, but for member updates, wanted to see if folks want to raise their hand if there are uh, any issues or items you'd like to raise to the group. Uh, perhaps um, included in that could be if you also have an agenda item for consideration for the next uh, quarterly meeting as well. Certainly, I think building off the agenda items today will be relevant to next the next quarter's uh, agenda too. So I see um, Derek's hand. Derek? Yeah, thank you, Michael. Uh, Marty mentioned at the beginning that uh, he uh, is uh, working uh, along with uh, Ginny uh, Parker Martin and myself on the climate uh, justice. Uh, just this morning, we met with uh, an expert in this space. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Bi Hui Ye. Uh, she used to work in uh, big energy, but she has since pivoted to focus more attention on equity and climate. So, and uh, we had a great dialogue talking about how to uh, work with the legislature, what kind of priorities we should set. So since uh, uh, Martin and I feel strongly that uh, climate and uh, equity and justice are interconnected. So maybe that one that's one of the upcoming topics we can include on our agenda. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. And perhaps that could include having someone speak to the details of right. what we should be considering as well. Other uh, member updates. I'm trying to scroll through. Okay, any additional agenda items? Uh, if not, then we can move to public comment. Ooh. Based on today's conversation, adding the climate um, conversation, our next agenda is getting to be pretty robust already. Okay, hearing none, hearing none, being mindful of time, uh, Amanda. Okay, Maria will go ahead and lead us through public comment if we have any. Thank you very much, Michael and Amanda. I apologize again, um, as a host, it's not letting me spotlight myself. So I hope you don't mind that you're not able to see me. Uh, so we're gonna move right along to public comment. Um, each speaker will have roughly two minutes. We do want to kind of limit it to hear from as many people as possible. And just a reminder, prior to making your comments, please be sure to state your name for the record and identify 
uh, any group or organization that you represent. You can engage in public comment by raising your hand, or if you're joining us by phone, it's star nine and we'll be able to unmute you. Just gonna give folks a couple more minutes. I'm not seeing any raised hands so far. Um, let's turn to members. Do any committee members have any additional thoughts or feedback that they'd like to share? And I'll, I'll kind of keep an eye on attendees in case uh, folks want to make a public comment, we can jump back. Okay, um, Amanda, I think I will pass it back to you. Okay, then. Well, um, next steps. So um, I think we have, you know, a good amount here. Um, long term care insurance review. Thank you to our volunteers. I have Michael, Cheryl, Marty, Denny, Donna, and Derek signed up. Thank you very much. Um, we'll follow up offline about that. I um, want to remind everyone about those intersections with equity and the various other committees out there. So um, if you feel like attending any um, committees in the meantime before our next meeting and want to bring back comments or thoughts or add as an agenda item, please just email me and we can put you on the agenda. Um, looking forward to further updates on vaccine equity uh, from Denny and other members of the vaccine committee. Um, we'll continue to follow up with C California Department of Public Health and um, provide updates to you. Um, otherwise, um, just I want to thank everyone for being here. Thank you for all the work that you're doing. Uh, feel free to reach out anytime um, to engage or to me or to Kim. Um, and if there are no further words, I, I have one ask. I have one ask. How do yeah. I? Do you have a link that we can that we can get this meeting? Um, can you can send to us? Over the long term care insurance? None. Over the whole meeting that we've just had. Oh sure, of course. So we'll post um, the recording and the slides to the Equity and Aging Resource Center. So if you go on. See California Department of Aging's front homepage, click on California for All Ages, and then there'll be a link there to our resource center. That is currently where I'm saving all of this committee's information. Okay. Um, and I, I think it'll likely stay there. Um, yeah, so we'll get that posted within the next couple of business days, and I will email everyone this PowerPoint in the meantime. Oh, good. If you'll, yes, if you'll email that, that would be great. <clears throat> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Love you all. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks, take care. Yep.